I invite you guys to take your Bibles and turn with me for our scripture reading for our sermon text this morning. We are going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It was a real bummer that I didn't get to preach my Reformation Day sermon last week, so you get it today. And, you know, it doesn't have to be preached on Reformation Day because it's true every week. So it'll work today. But we're going to look at the text that I had selected to preach for the commemoration of the Protestant Reformation. And that text is 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to read together verses 10 through 17. So I invite you to please stand for the reading of Holy Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll read together verses 10 through 17. And this is God's holy word for us, his people. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is God's holy word for us, his people. So let's ask him to bless our time in his word today. Father, this is your word that you have spoken to us for your glory and for our good and our benefit. And I pray that you would now bless not only the reading of this scripture, but also now especially the preaching of your word. We pray that you would write the eternal truth of your word upon our hearts, that you would use your word to change our minds, to correct us, to change our hearts, and to change the direction and purpose of our very lives, that you would shape and mold us today more into the image of Christ as we seek to glorify him by listening to his word and being taught by him. Feed us now, Lord, we pray, with your word. And may we receive all you have for us today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Sometimes, reformed people can be pretty weird. I mean, you've met me, right? A few years ago, I came across a post in a reformed Facebook group, a very dangerous place to be. I came across a post that I just had to shake my head at. The person posted a question to the group that said, and I quote, Where can I find reformed socks? Where can I find reformed socks? I had to comment in this Facebook group. And my comment, I had two comments. My first comment was this. I said, I think this is going a little too far. Uh, This guy is clearly getting a little carried away. (laughs) 
That's comment number one. My second comment was this. If I had any reform socks, I would definitely wear them, though. <laughs> so perhaps, you know, maybe I'm just as, uh, maybe I'm just as weird as this guy who asked the question. Because I thought, reform socks, that's crazy. But I would definitely wear them if I had them. <laughs> Very strange. Reform people can be pretty weird. So, uh, you know, the, we don't have any uh, reform socks that I know of. I don't think they're out there. Um, but somebody commented on this post and, and with a link to a website that did have all kinds of reformed apparel and gear and clothing and stuff, which was pretty cool. Uh, now, they didn't have any socks, unfortunately, but um, they did have this beautiful T-shirt with the five solas on it. Now, you've all heard of the solas, right? Sola is the Latin word for only or alone. And the five solas are basically five Latin slogans that capture the reformers' views on the five areas of protest against the Roman Catholic Church of their day. So when you think five solas, think five Latin slogans that capture the reformers' views on the top five areas of protest against the Roman Catholic Church of their day. And so these, uh, these areas of protest are what make us protestant or protestant. The word protest is right there in the name. And these are the top five areas, these five solas. Now, this morning, I want to take up one of those slogans and talk about one of those areas of protest. And it's this. It's the area of religious judgment. Religious judgment. Now, I don't mean religious people being judgmental. Religious folks being judgy of other people. That's not what I mean. I mean the right of judgment in matters of religion. The right of judgment in matters of religion. Matters of faith and worship. Doctrine and practice. Discipline and government. Belief and behavior. Who gets to make the final judgment on truth and error? Right and wrong for the church. It's a question of very great significance. Who ultimately gets to decide, both for the church as a whole and for you, the individual believer, who gets to decide what we should believe, how we should live, how we should worship and serve the Lord? What norm or rule or standard, what highest court of appeals in whose judgment we must ultimately rest has the Lord Jesus as head of the church given to his people? What ultimate authority has he given to us to guide and govern the Christian religion? That's the issue that was at stake in the Reformation. And it's an issue that we must constantly come back to today. It's that ultimate question of, says who? You should believe this and do this. Says who? Who's the ultimate authority? Who gets to decide this for me and for our church? This is what I mean by the area of religious judgment. Our passage this morning in 2 Timothy 3 is one of the key texts from which the Reformers developed their answer to these questions. And based on this passage and a number of others that we'll consider this morning, the Reformers stood in protest against Rome and declared sola scriptura. The Latin phrase for scripture alone. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone has the right of final judgment in all matters 
of the Christian faith because Scripture alone is the Word of God. The only inspired and infallible rule of faith that God has deemed necessary to reveal to us. That's what they believed. That's what they stood for. That's what many of them gave their lives and their blood to defend. And that's what I want us to look at today. As we turn to the text, we will see why the reformers came to this conviction based on the testimony of Scripture itself. Often in in debates and discussions and arguments back and forth between Protestants and Roman Catholics from the Reformation all the way up to today, often when we talk about the authority of Scripture and this specifically sola scriptura, the objection comes back at us, but where does the Bible teach that? You say that we got to get we got to get our theology and our practice from the Bible because it's our ultimate authority. But where does the Bible itself tell you to do that? And that's a fantastic question. That's the right question that they should ask. And we need to be prepared with the right answer. And that's what we're going to see today. Where does the Bible teach sola scriptura? That's where we're going. Second Timothy chapter 3. This letter... 2 Timothy, is the final letter that Paul wrote before he was martyred. It's his last words. This letter contains Paul's last words, his parting instructions to Timothy, who was a young pastor and a close follower of Paul. Timothy will now no longer be able to ask Paul for advice. Paul's been his mentor, and now Timothy's not going to be able to go to Paul anymore for advice or for help or for further teaching and direction in the ministry. And Paul knows that Timothy must now stand on his own. And he gives Timothy two directions in our text. Two directions. First, Paul encourages Timothy to remember and abide by All that Paul had taught him. Look at verses 10 and 11. Paul says to Timothy, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, which persecutions I endured, and from them all the Lord rescued me. Do you see what Paul's saying? He's telling Timothy, look, you have followed all these things you've learned and seen and gleaned from me. All these things that you've been taught by me and trained, Paul discipled Timothy to be the man of God that he was, the pastor that he was. And then verse 14 he says... As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And the Greek word underneath that word, whom, is plural. Knowing from those multiple people from whom you learned it. Continue steadfastly, Timothy, in all the stuff you learned from me and everybody else that you learned it from. And as he mentions in verse 15, from childhood, you've been acquainted with Scripture. From childhood, Timothy has been taught by his faithful mother and grandmother, as we read in other places in First and Second Timothy. Timothy has been trained and taught as a child all the way up to the day he met Paul, and Paul was his mentor up until the day Paul died. And so here's the first thing we've got to recognize in this whole debate about sola scriptura. We must recognize the important and necessary role of pastors, teachers, parents, friends, fellow believers, and heroes in the church and in the faith to disciple us and lead and guide us in our faith as we walk with Christ. The doctrine of sola scriptura does not mean and has never meant it's just you and your Bible alone out in the woods under a tree and I don't need anybody else. 
Just me and the Bible, and I don't need a pastor to teach me. I don't need to read a book. I don't need a study Bible. I don't need a commentary. No scholars. My parents, I don't need them. Fellow believers, discipleship. Nope, I just need the Bible, and that's all I got, and that's all I need. And that's never what anybody meant by sola scriptura. That's what some have called solo scriptura. Just you and your Bible out there by yourself. And you don't need the church, and you don't need pastors, and you don't need anything else. And that's not what the doctrine is. And that's not what Paul told Timothy to do. Paul told Timothy, you learned all this stuff from your parents and me and other teachers, and you've been discipled, and you are to continue in that stuff. Hold fast to that. We need each other to disciple each other and to teach and learn. And it certainly doesn't mean that God has put no other authority structures in place in the church. He certainly has. He's put all sorts of authority structures in place. Let me just read a couple other texts from the New Testament. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders... Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So whether it's the the disciples back then, or people in the early church, or the Middle Ages, or the Reformers, or us today, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so we are to follow those who follow Christ. We're to be discipled. Paul says, imitate me the way I imitate Jesus. Just a stunning thing to say. Follow my faith. Timothy, remember my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, patience, love, steadfastness, and yes, even my persecutions and sufferings. And follow in my example. Titus chapter 2. Show yourself in all respects. This is Paul talking to, not Timothy, but Titus another pastor, and he's telling Titus, show yourself as a pastor in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. And then he tells Titus in chapter 2, verse 15, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, and don't let anybody disregard you as a pastor. So the New Testament and Paul himself believed firmly that there is a real church and real pastors and a real church government and real church officers and there's this whole system of authority and support that we are to follow. Those things are vital to the health of the church. We need one another. We need the church. We need teachers and all the rest. Sola Scriptura is not a denial of other authorities and it's not the denial that we need pastors and teachers and preachers and each other, because we certainly do. God's ordained those things for our benefit. Sola Scriptura doesn't contradict that at all. That's the first thing, the first direction Paul gives in this text. Here's the second direction. He says... Yes, you should follow my example and remember the people you've learned from. But number two, Paul also directs Timothy to a greater authority than even his own as an apostle. Look at verses 14 and 15. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy had Scripture before he ever met Paul, and he will have Scripture long after Paul is gone. Paul points Timothy to the God-inspired Scriptures, the God-breathed Scriptures. And in the next two verses, verses 16 and 17, Paul summarizes his doctrine of Scripture. And in this summary, we can detect five attributes of Scripture. And these are the five things listed on your sermon notes 
insert. We can detect five attributes of Scripture. And these five attributes define the Reformation doctrine of sola scriptura. And these five attributes determine the Protestant answer to the questions regarding the area of religious judgment. So we're going to quickly highlight what each of these five are. The very first attribute of Scripture that Paul mentions is this. It's based on the origin of Scripture. It's the doctrine of inspiration. Scripture alone is inspired. Verse 16, look at it very carefully. All Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Breathed out. It's the Word of God breathed out by God. And if, you're, if you just hold your hand up in front of your mouth close enough and you just start talking, you can, you can hear what you're saying. You can understand the words you're saying, but you can also feel your breath hitting against your hand. And so spoken communication, speech, always has those two parts. The mental content that you understand when you hear the words, and then the physical act of speaking. It's the breath, the vibrations in the air that comes out. There's a physical piece to speech, and then there's the mental piece of speech. And you hear the physical part, and you understand with your mind the mental part. So they both go together. And this is saying that all Scripture is breathed out by God which means not only the meaning of the words, but the very words are inspired by God. Every part of Scripture comes from a divine source. It is produced by God. Peter tells us, the Apostle Peter tells us, how God used the human authors to create the Scriptures. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 he says, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the apostles and prophets who wrote the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And he, the Spirit carried them along. As they spoke these words, they did not originate in the mind and will and heart of man. They originate in the mind and heart and will of God through the Holy Spirit, moving, inspiring the authors of Scripture to produce the very words of God. God has breathed out every part of Scripture. That's number one, divine inspiration. The second attribute is based on the nature of Scripture, owing to its divine origin, the attribute of inerrancy. Scripture alone is inerrant. Verse 16 again, the whole verse. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Paul says that all of Scripture, every part is God's breath, God's voice, God speaking. The words, meaning, and message are exactly as God intended. So Christian, when you read the Bible, you are reading the mind of God. When you meditate on the Bible... You are thinking God's thoughts after Him. Paul makes this point in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. He says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man... Nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul's gospel has a divine origin, inspiration. And therefore, 
It is not man's gospel or man's word. It is God's. And Paul makes this even clearer in 1 Thessalonians, uh, or in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. He says, We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God which is at work in you believers. So you hear what Paul is saying? He's saying the Bible is God's word in human words. The authors of Scripture spoke normal human languages. And when you pick up your Bible, it's in normal written human language, translated into English. But even in the original Greek and Hebrew, it's still just normal, old, plain human language, human words. But it's not from man. It's God's word expressed in human words. It's both. Scripture comes to us from human beings through human history. But the message we receive is the very speech of God. And therefore, it cannot be inaccurate or untrue. Because God is incapable of inaccuracy and falsehood. This is where inerrancy comes from. It's a theological conclusion based on the origin of Scripture. If Scripture comes from God, if it's His thoughts and words and speech, then it can't contradict God's nature. If God cannot be in error, and if these are His very words, they cannot be in error either. They must participate in some of the divine qualities of God Himself. And that's why the Bible's not merely a human book. It is a human book. Human beings wrote it. But it's not merely human. It's also, at the same time, and more fundamentally, the Word of God. With the Holy Spirit as the chief author of all of Scripture. If you believe the Bible, Christian, it will never lead you astray. If you, if you read something in Scripture and you believe it's true, it will never lead you into error and falsehood. It will never lead you to believe something that God doesn't intend for you to believe. You the interpreter, the reader, you might make errors and mistakes all the time, and we do. I misread the Bible from time to time too. Who doesn't? We're human. We're sinful. We're fallen. We're limited. We make mistakes. We read into it things we shouldn't. We find stuff that was never there to begin with for all sorts of reasons. None of us are perfect readers and perfect interpreters of Scripture. There's no such thing except Jesus. So we might make errors and mistakes, but God's Word never makes the error. The problem is with us, not with the Bible. So listen to Paul again. I just quoted from 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Earlier in that chapter, in verses 2-4, to 4, this is what Paul says. He says, But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God, or God's gospel, in the midst of much conflict. And listen to verse 3. For our appeal, when Paul preaches the gospel, he's making an appeal to his hearers. Our appeal in preaching God's gospel, he says, does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. So you hear what Paul's saying? He's saying, look, the gospel we preach, the word of God that you heard from us, it did not come from any attempt to deceive, and it didn't come from any impurity. That's Paul talking about his own motives and his own heart. There was, no any, there was no attempt to deceive on my part, and there was no impurity in me when I preached the gospel to you. It was from pure motives, he means. Pure motives. But then he mentions a third thing. It does not spring from error. Now, that's not something that is up to Paul. That's not, I mean, yeah, 
Paul can have integrity and not try to trick anybody when he preaches the gospel. And Paul can have pure motives and not try to be like getting rich or trying to just trick people. And his motives can be pure. His methods can be pure. But whether he's right or wrong isn't up to Paul. He says, it did, the message we preach did not come from any attempt to deceive. It did not come from impurity. And it did not come from error. Paul preached from a pure heart with pure motives, but the message, he says, was without error. 1 Thessalonians 2, 3. Our appeal, our gospel did not spring from error. It's inerrant. Paul's message is inerrant, he says, because it isn't his word. It's God's word. The Bible is inspired and inerrant because it has a divine origin in the Holy Spirit. And therefore, Scripture bears a divine quality. That's the first two attributes. Scripture alone is inspired. Scripture alone is inerrant. Number three. The third attribute of the Bible is based on Scripture's power and its profitability. Scripture is infallible. Scripture alone is infallible. Verses 15 and 16 in our text. He says, From childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is a very important point here, the infallibility of Scripture. The reason Scripture is useful and profitable for these things that we just read in verses 15 and 16, the reason Scripture is useful and profitable for these things is because it is uniquely crafted and designed by God to function in just this way. Scripture is profitable because it is fit and capable to be profitable. The reason that you always choose a hammer to drive a nail instead of a flip-flop is because that's what a hammer is made for and your flip-flop isn't. Timothy is told to take up the hammer of Scripture. The thing God has designed and given to Timothy, to pastors, to the church, to Christians. He says, take the instrument God has made for you. Take up the hammer of Scripture and use it to drive home the nails of your pastoral calling. Timothy is told by Paul to use the Bible to bring people to faith in Christ for salvation. Use the Bible to teach people the faith, Timothy. Use the Bible, Timothy, to reprove those in sin. Use the Bible, Timothy, to correct false beliefs. Timothy, I'm about to be martyred. Listen, Timothy, use the Bible to train Christians in how to live a righteous life. The Bible is always able to be used profitably for these things because, and this is essential, it never needs to be on the receiving end of these things. The Bible has no need to be given further wisdom. The Bible does not need to be taught or instructed. You do, I do, we do. The Bible is given to us so that we can be taught and we can be given wisdom and we can be instructed. You don't reprove or correct or discipline the Bible <laughs> because it's God's Word. And God has no need to be corrected or have His wisdom supplemented or anything else. So when it says Scripture is profitable for teaching, it means Scripture doesn't need your teaching. You need Scripture's teaching. Scripture is profitable for reproof. The Bible doesn't get reproved. It does the reproving. The Bible does the correcting. The Bible does the training and teaching in righteousness. That's what God made it and designed it for. 
And we don't get to stand in judgment over the Word of God. It stands in judgment over us. Paul makes this point in Romans 11, verses 33 to 36, the great doxology at the end of chapter 11 in Romans. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. The depths of His wisdom and knowledge. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable are His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been His counselor? Who has given Him a gift that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. You see, God's knowledge is perfect and therefore God's Word is infallible. It does not have error because it cannot, and it cannot because God, the author, cannot. Because the Bible has a divine origin, it bears certain divine qualities. And those include inspiration, inerrancy, and infallibility. Number four. The fourth attribute is the consequence of the previous three we just looked at. And it's based on the fact that Paul does not direct Timothy to any other source for his ministry that is equal with Scripture. The Bible says Scripture is God-breathed, and it doesn't tell us that there's any other such thing in the universe. Only Scripture is breathed out by God. Nothing else is, and therefore nothing else is like it. It's unique. The fourth attribute is Scripture alone is supreme. Supreme. Paul directs Timothy to nothing but God-inspired to God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible scriptures as the instrument he ought to employ for teaching, reproof, correction, and training. And what this tells us is that scripture is the authority in the church. There is nothing higher than or equal to the Bible that God has given to his church. In Paul's final message to Timothy, this was the perfect moment for him. This was the perfect moment for Paul in his parting words to Timothy to tell Timothy where else he needed to go, what else he needed to use, what other thing was needed or necessary to look for as an authoritative instrument in the pulpit or in teaching or in the church. Paul does tell Timothy, remember all the stuff you've learned. Remember your training. Remember your upbringing. Remember your discipleship. Don't forget all that stuff. You need that stuff. But it's not God-breathed. Scripture is. Scripture is God-breathed. And there isn't anything else like Scripture. In chapter 4 of 2 Timothy... The first two verses, it said, Paul says, in the next breath, out of, after just talking about the nature of Scripture, the next thing out of his mouth, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. You hear all this authority he's heaping on the Bible? I charge you in the presence of God, And in the presence of Jesus himself, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. I mean, he is heaping up all the things that are authoritative. God, Christ, the final judgment, the appearing in the kingdom of Jesus. By all that is holy, by all that is authoritative in heaven, I'm telling you, Timothy, I charge you to do this. Not preach tradition. Not preach Paul, not preach anything else but the Word. Preach the Word, Timothy. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. The Bible carries the full weight of authority for preaching, teaching, evangelism, rebuking, correcting, and discipleship in righteous living. 
which means Scripture bears the very authority of God. If the Bible comes from God, it will bear God's authority, and there is no higher authority. Therefore, Scripture is supreme because it is the very voice of God speaking to His people. And this brings us to the fifth and final attribute of Scripture from our passage this morning. Scripture alone is sufficient. Scripture is sufficient. Last verse of our text, verse 17. He says, That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Armed with Scripture, Timothy is complete. With Scripture, Paul says, Timothy is fully and thoroughly equipped, fully supplied, fitted sufficiently for his ministry. Scripture all by itself makes Timothy fully equipped. Scripture fully equips Timothy to do the work he's been called to do. The Bible is enough. The Bible is sufficient. The Bible is perfect. It lacks nothing that we need to live out the Christian faith and reach eternal life. And other scriptures in the New Testament confirm this. Scripture is sufficient for salvation, James 1.21. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Scripture is sufficient for salvation. Scripture is sufficient for the Christian life. Uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. His divine power, Peter says, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Where are those precious and very great promises for you, Christian? You can't find them anywhere else than Scripture. They come from the Bible. And this says that through those great and precious promises, through the words of Scripture, you have access to the divine nature. Why? Because that's where these words come from. And through Scripture, you have a connection, a union, and communion with God Himself such that you have everything you need for life and godliness. Scripture is sufficient for salvation, and it is sufficient to live the Christian life. Or as Psalm 19.7 says, bringing both of these together, the law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So now we have before us the five attributes of Scripture based on 2 Timothy. The Bible is inspired. It is inerrant, infallible, supreme, and sufficient. This means the Bible possesses the moral perfection truthfulness, and authority of God. These are the divine attributes that make the Bible the Word of God. God has given us nothing else like it. We refer to the Bible's absolute uniqueness with the term sola scriptura. Scripture alone is the supreme and sufficient revelation from God of all we must believe and do. And that is the Protestant answer to the question of who has the right of final judgment in Christianity. The reason this was a slogan for protest is because that is not the teaching, the view of 
the Roman Catholic Church. It wasn't then and it isn't now. Rome teaches a different doctrine. Not sola scriptura, they teach sola ecclesia. Ecclesia is the Latin word for church. Sola ecclesia, the church alone. The church, the pope, tradition, the magisterium, the bishops. They have the ultimate right of judgment. They get to tell you what the Bible is and what the Bible means and what tradition is and what tradition means. Therefore, they, the church, has ultimate authority. And because they claim to have ultimate authority over the Bible, the Bible can't speak to them anymore. Because if you have ultimate authority to determine the Bible, if you sit in judgment over Scripture... Scripture can't correct you anymore. It's a closed book. It can't teach you because the infallibility that the Bible has now belongs to the church. And this is what Rome taught in the past, and it's what they teach today. Sola ecclesia. We, the church, have the ultimate right of judgment, not the Bible. The Bible's important. We don't, you know, they don't dislike the Bible. The Bible's very, very important for Catholics, but it's subordinate to the church, and it's on the same level as all the unwritten tradition from church history. Tradition and the Bible sit side by side, and the church is over both. That's sola ecclesia. Protestants believe tradition and church sit side by side, and the Bible's over both. That's what makes us Protestant, and that was what they were protesting. The reformers stood for the truth of sola scriptura. Scripture alone is the final judge because God himself speaks therein. So to conclude, I want to read to you from our confession of faith, the Westminster Confession. It gives a perfect statement of this doctrine. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, section 10. The supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined... And all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men and private spirits are to be examined and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking in the Scripture. We believe the supreme judge over all controversies of religion can only be the Holy Spirit speaking in the Scripture. This is what it means to be Protestant Christian. We believe that in the Bible alone, God has given us an all-sufficient word as the ultimate rule of faith and the final authority of all that we believe and all that we do. So let us stand on this God-given book. Let us love this book, cherish this book, hunger for this book, yearn for this book, want to know this book. Ask God to give us eyes to look into this book and through it and to see our God and to see our Savior. This is the all-sufficient word. Let us stand as the reformers did on this word. Let's pray. Father, we believe that your word is true and powerful. We believe that your word is mighty and effective. By your word, you made the universe, and through your word in the gospel, you made each of us into new creatures. It's by your word alone that anything of eternal value is accomplished in our sinful and broken world. There is no other source of truth that we can look to and rely upon to tell us the whole truth all the time. No matter how reliable and trustworthy other sources are, your word is the most reliable. It never fails us. It never deceives us. It never leads us astray. It makes us wise for salvation. It teaches us what to believe. It shows us how to live. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And where else can we go, Lord Jesus? Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life and no one else. 
So help us to be lovers of this book, to lean in, to read it, absorb it, soak it in, know it, treasure it, hide it in our hearts, practice it in our lives, discuss it with our families and with our friends and our co-workers and spread the gospel and let us be Bible people. May we hide this word in our hearts and treasure it deep within and then let us go and open our mouths and speak the words of life to those around us who need it. Let us speak your word to one another. Let us trust this word. Make our church dominated by nothing but this passion to know what says the Lord and to do all that you call us to do. In all of our preaching and teaching, all of our ministering, all of our programs, all of our outreach, everything we do, may we be firmly rooted in your scriptures. Because it's only when we stand upon your word that we know we're standing upon solid ground that cannot be shaken. Thank you for giving us that place to stand. Send your Holy Spirit to us to make us faithful to stand there no matter what our world, culture, or society thinks about it, to stand firm when everything else is shaking. Thank you that we have this anchor for our souls. Help us to trust you, to absorb this book, to be shaped and molded by it. And let us walk in the light of your word for your great glory and for our ultimate good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.